Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Barnabas Health, NJM, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, New Jersey's Credit Unions, PSENG, TD Bank, Community Education Centers, the New Jersey Hospital Association, and by these public-spirited organizations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the issues that matter. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're here in the State House in the great state of New Jersey. We're here in the Senate chamber, but in fact, we're here with the Speaker of the Assembly, the relatively new Speaker of the Assembly, Vincent Prieto. It is an honor to be with you here. How are you doing? It's great to be here, Steve. Great. Uh, your journey into this position, the, uh, the leader of the lower house right down the hallway, is a fascinating one. At 10 years of age, you came to the United States from Cuba. Right. Talk about that. Um, it's uh, exciting, yet um, daunting uh, experience. Um, you know, my mother had wanted to uh, give me an opportunity. I'm the youngest of four children. Uh, she had me later in life, um, so I'm uh, like eight years younger than the closest one to, to me. I always say that uh, I was the, the girl, she was looking for a girl too, I only had boys. <laughs> uh, but she wanted to give me uh, an opportunity. I was born right at the beginning of communism, so we struggled during those times. So the first 10 years of my life were under a communist regime, so it was kind mm -hmm. of tough times. So she wanted a better life for me, so she took advantage mm -hmm. of the freedom flights. Uh, it took about five years to be able to, to get uh, a flight. Uh, from 1965 to, we, we actually got out in uh, 1971, mm -hmm. and we made the journey uh, to America. Uh, we had some relatives in New Jersey, uh, that was my grandmother and my uncle, and we came uh, and established ourselves here. The name Castro means what to you? Hmm. A, a whole array of things. Um, it means, um, tough times, uh, it means communism, it means dictatorship. Um, uh, it's kind of um, something emotional. Uh, a lot of people don't understand. Emotional. Yeah, emotional. Um, not just political? Not just political, emotional, because there's, a, you know, people, people get hurt, uh, families were broken apart. Uh, I left cousins, I left older brothers that eventually they, my mother was able to sponsor them out to different countries uh, and they were able to come to this country. Um, so it's, it's emotional because there, there's a lot, you know, for people to understand and a lot of people fight and say, well, there shouldn't be an embargo and to me there really isn't. They could deal with the rest of the nation but with the United States, I'm adamant about that, that we shouldn't. Uh, when somebody can come in into your place of business and tell you, uh, you no longer own this, you can no longer work this here, uh, this is now property of the state. Uh, you have nowhere to work, mm. nowhere to go. I think that's very tough, that's very emotional. Mr. Speaker, how do you think that your, I mean, everyone's experience, I mean, growing up, there are so many members of the legislature, both houses, 120 members, their individual experience, the diverse background that each one of them has had. I'm sure affects their view of government, yeah. their politics, their ideology. How do you think your experience, your incredible experience coming here at 10 years of age from Cuba in 1971, right? How do you think it's affected your view of public policy, of public life? Uh, it, I think it, it shapes who you are and how you think, uh, your background. So it's, for me, it's been, uh, I've always was, helped when we got here. So that has shaped me. This what does that mean? Um, people, uh, friends, 
family were always giving a lending hand. So I think that when you see that you can give a lending hand, and that's why I think government is so important, and that uh, handout that some people say, oh, they just are trying to take, those things could be giant steps forward for somebody. We, this is the land of opportunity, and we always talk about that. And you do the most you can with whatever you get, but you need that chance. And I think what it has brought to me is you could succeed, and you could be anything you want, as we tell our kids, but we have to give them the resources, and at least the start. Now, does everybody take advantage of it? Absolutely not. Do some people abuse the system? Yes, they do. But then that's up to us that create policy mm -hmm. to make sure how we shape that, that that doesn't happen. Could you have been a Republican? Could I have been a Republican? Because many of those um, who came from Cuba are, in fact, Republicans. You're not. Why not? Um, I guess the area that I come from is very democratic. Number what does one. that mean, geographically? Geographically, it's democratic. But um, what does that have to do with it, your it, ideology here? It, ha it has <laughs> nothing to do. But there, I, I have my own thoughts on that. My brother-in-law uh, and By I. By the way, I'm sorry for interrupting. Are there other members of your family who are in fact not Democrats but Republicans? Uh, yes. Okay. They are. You have and, spirited family discussions? A little bit, a little <laughs> bit. And uh, my brother-in-law, which was my partner, and I always talk about it, and during uh, my, my speech when I got sworn in. You mean your business partner? I met my business partner. Okay. And he considers himself a libertarian. And I always tell him, no, you're not. I said, you think you are. It's just he is some, sort of like I am. They're somewhere in the middle, and I always think that there's always yeah. room for compromise. So some people have called me a centrist because I'm in the middle, and, and I could see both sides, but I do have the democratic values. And the thing is that a lot of people don't un really understand what being Republican, what being Democrat uh, is. Now, what does being a Democrat mean to you? To me, being a Democrat uh, is the policy that we create, the values that we have, that the programs that we create and have to the members of society and our constituents, it's very important for them. Uh, a lot of people uh, don't believe that we should have all these programs. And they said, well, if we're gonna cut and we're gonna do this, and you know, when we've been talking lately about a tax cut. Yeah. And you know. You're and, adamantly against that, why? Well, because we can't afford it. And it's not because I don't want a tax cut. Everybody loves a tax cut. I would love to be able to give a tax cut today. But the problem is the numbers have not been there. And then if you look at history, and, and we looked at the governor's state of the state this year, compared to what he said last year, he's touting a tax cut. This year, now, not only was not a tax cut talked about, we're talking potentially we can't afford to make our pension payment even though we knew what those numbers were a year ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm a realist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm not an optimist. I, I deal in reality. And given my background, I always see the glass not just half full. If there's less than half, you have something. And there's something you can do with that. The, the other issues, by the way, the other thing, I have to do this. I, I promise we're going we're gonna to actually try to get uh, two sit-downs with uh, the speaker, uh, part one and part two. But I, I want to ask you this. Before we do more in issues, your professional background, fascinating. You did some plumbing work, professional yes. plumber. Mm -hmm. But the other part, you, you got to do the bodybuilding thing. You, no, th come on, Mr. Speaker, I have to ask mm -hmm. you. You're yes. the only member of the legislature that we know of who had a professional background as a bodybuilder. Yeah, that was. Um, well, what's the matter? You, you, you don't no, want to talk about that? No, I definitely. I have. I've never <laughs> hidden that as part of my resume. Uh, as I mentioned, the internet's a dangerous thing. It, it, it is, <laughs> but it, I actually preceded the internet a little bit. But uh, there's a gym uh, that was the uh, the gym that I competed out of. Right. That, uh, there's a picture somewhere up there of me. Back in the uh, day. Back in the day. Back in the day. But it was something that I was very proud of. Uh, I enjoyed it tremendously. What did it teach you? Yeah, a lot of discipline. Uh, bodybuilding, especially your diet is 90%. So you have to be very disciplined, very regiment oriented. Uh, the times you, you, uh, you lift, what you eat, it's like uh, you live by the clock and you're always on. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't steer off left and right. You have to stay on that straight path. And I think that teaches you a lot about self-discipline, what your goals are, mm -hmm. 
where you have to get to. Does it affect the way you govern? I think it helps. I think because you're never late. I'm never. I uh, noticed that. Yeah. Even for this shoot, you were right on. You're actually a little bit early. Yeah. Does uh, it bother you that your colleagues don't see the world in such a clear-cut fashion? Um, They're not as disciplined. I'm, 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 I'm getting them to, to sort of understand Oh, you're getting that. them. I'm getting them to understand that. Um, you getting I, them to work with weights at all? Uh, well, that may be, that'll, <laughs> that, that'll be uh, the next project. Okay. But my first thing is about being on time. Cubans are, are notoriously known for Cuban time, but they're always late. I'm always there on time for the reason being, I like to see what happens. I don't like to be told what happened. So I like to experience it. So that has been part of my uh, growing up. And mm. uh, I want to bring that as part to my meetings. When I became the budget chairman, my meetings were on time. You were chair of the Assembly Budget Committee. Yes, for the last two years. Why is that so important to you, by the way? You're big into numbers. Um, when did, I read that you got into numbers. I'm thinking, when did it, your thing with numbers start? And how has that manifested well, itself as chair of the Budget Committee? Well, I was always um, very good with numbers. Um, my father was an accountant. Uh, I was going to uh, school for accounting. Um, I left that and then went into the building trades, became a plumber, uses a lot of math. There's a lot of angles, there's a lot of uh, numbers. No, you're talking angles in math. You mm -hmm. don't mean angles in politics? No, angles in math. I just want to clarify. Yes. Okay. Uh, my daughter is a uh, math teacher. She's a math major, uh, has a master's in math. So numbers are in uh, our family. Uh, numbers don't lie. Numbers add up. And one plus one will always be two. And that's why I said simple arithmetic is what, it's common sense. So when we talked about uh, a tax cut that I'm adamantly against, I'm not against the tax cut. I'm against a tax cut we can't afford. And it has to be the right uh, uh, mm. tax cut. But at the end of the day, like right now, we're struggling our pension payments. Is that the way you look at the pension situation? Th it doesn't add up in your mind? Well, the pension, we made a commitment that the commitment was in seven years we were going to fully fund it. We knew year one was approximately 465 million, year two was 1.1 a billion, then year three was the year we just passed was 1.7. This coming year will be 2.4 billion. So we know what these payments are out. It'll be about 5.5 by 2017. That in itself, I think it's a problem because we need reoccurring revenues to be able to accommodate that extra burden that we're going to have, that we have to do. We can't take another pension holiday as we did through the 90s. The members uh, uh, you know, that work and contribute to their pension. State employees. State employees and municipal employees. You know, they, they're making their payment. We're the ones that stop making that payment. So we have to make sure that pension is there for them when they retire. Why don't we do this? Uh, in the next sit down with you, we'll talk about a range of other issues. Education issues? Absolutely. Issues that have to do with some fiscal policy, but also your views uh, on immigration. The DREAM Act is a big deal, yes, right? Yes, very much. And some other issues uh, affecting um, your colleagues on both sides of the island. Trenton, okay? Absolutely. We're having a conversation with the Assembly Speaker, Vincent Prieto. Uh, has a fascinating background. Stay tuned. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, Steve Adubato here in the Senate Chamber in the uh, State House in New Jersey. We're speaking with the Assembly Speaker, Vincent Prieto, who was uh, the first uh, time we sat down with him. We talked about a range of issues, including the fact that he has a fascinating background. We continue that discussion, Mr. Speaker. Let me ask you about um, the health care situation in the state. Um, back in the fall of 2013, we don't need to reiterate how horrific the rollout was for Obamacare. Your view going forward in terms of getting those enrolled who need to be enrolled, who have not had access to quality health care, couldn't afford it, go. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, I think that um, 
getting the word out there, make sure we enroll everybody. It's very important. Um, we have so many um, people in this state that um, did not have health insurance. That's why our charity care uh, was so problematic that you know that you would have people that their first line of defense was when they went to the hospital, when it is too late. If you have preventive medicine, that also will be very helpful. Mm -hmm. That will actually lower the cost of health care. So I think it's very important uh, to us. I think we, we, I think we did a little bit of a mistake when we did not do the health exchange for New Jersey. We left a lot of money. You mean let the federal? Sorry for interrupting. Let the federal government run the health exchange. That's as opposed to the state running it. Right. We, well, Governor Christie at the time said, "Look, they're screwing. They're not doing such a great job. It's their program. It's not our program. Let the feds run it." But I, I get that. But if we would have set up that health exchange program in New Jersey, we would have been eligible for money that would have been. Uh, for us to have uh, getting the word out there. Having the federal do it was about maybe two million dollars for that access for people to know how to sign up. I mean public up. education. Public education. We left a lot of money on the tables. Uh, Maryland, I believe, got like 18 million by setting up their own. We would have gotten more money than they did. So I think that was something that was not wise of us to do, and we could have controlled it ourselves. I know the governor had his own views on it. But, but Mr. But Speaker, I, respectfully, would you acknowledge that the Obama administration mm -hmm. has done, by most people's objective analysis, an extremely poor job, not just rolling it out, but communicating and sharing information and getting things ready so that people could access. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I, I guess it's a fair assessment. And, and what I would tell you is I don't know what, when they set up that website, that it should have been done better. I, obviously, with today's technology, it should have right. been rolled out better. Uh, education on it would have been better. You know, people to know what access and to be able to sign up for it, I think it should have been rolled out better. I think they they made the adjustments that they needed You're to do. You're confident moving forward. I think so. I think this is going to be a good thing. It was just the growing pains of it. Mm -hmm. And I think people were putting too much on a problem with a website as equating it to that this is not going to work. And I don't think that's the okay. fact. Let's talk education. Um, Governor Christie in the State of the State talked about, I mean, there's so many education issues in the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, longer school day, longer school year, right. you say? Uh, something we need to talk about. You're open. Uh, I'm open to talk about it, but what's the price tag with it? At the end of the day, we are talking about us being able to afford things and uh, priorities. And in his state of the state, he basically talked about that we may not be able to make pension payments, but we need to do certain things. A longer school day, uh, a longer school year has to cost more. How are we going to pay for it? So these are, we need to talk about it. I don't think that you dismiss it right away. You need to look at it. And I'm, and I'm willing to have that conversation. We need to bring in the stakeholders, the people, that the professionals that are dealing with it, get their, their take on it. Let us see if it works. Mm. It may be a good thing, but it may be something not doable at this point in time. We're sitting down with the Speaker of the State Assembly, Vincent Prieto. Um, it's a fascinating time here in the State House. We're actually taping on the 21st of uh, January. There's an inauguration going on today, mm -hmm. but this interview will air afterwards. And so the issues we're talking about are, I would like to say they're evergreen, even though things evolve. These issues sustain, if you will. But what, what may evolve is relationships. Describe your relationship as we speak today with the governor and the governor's office. Um, my relationship in these fascinating times. Well, I, I take everything into perspective, and in these fascinating times, there's other variables uh, working themselves out. I always say you need to put those in perspective. That's separate issues. The relationship governing has to continue. We have to have the relationships. Um, everybody uh, has to do their job. And I think my job is the leader of the People's House, the Assembly. And our thing is to create laws, uh, create programs. We have a budget that we have to start getting through. So Constitutionally, we have to, as you know better than anyone, as the chair of the Budget Committee, by the last day of June when that clock strikes right. midnight, uh, right. the Constitution says the state budget has to be in place. You have concerns that that's going to happen this year? Uh, I'm always confident. I think every a governor has had a balanced budget because we're mandated by our constitution, as you mentioned. Um, I think we will get there. 
It's just, you know, how is it going to be an easy path or is it going to be a rocky path? I'm not too sure. And as I said before, our obligation of payments are growing every year. Our needs are growing. We need revenue sources. And if we don't figure out what those are, that's going to be a continuing revenue stream to pay for all these programs, and whether it's education, transportation, health care, mm. all these things, they're important. There's, there's so many. Uh, as the budget chairman, I got to yeah. see how, how government works. Every aspect, I dealt with everything. So uh, you're in tune with everything. Everything's important. We have to prioritize what's at the top of the list. You know, it's so interesting. You talk about uh, taxes and uh, talk about transportation. What do you say to those who say, look, we, for years we haven't had a stable source of funding and transportation in terms of the, the something called the Transportation Trust Fund right. uh, eons ago when I actually served in the state legislature in the mid 1980s um, in the other house, in, right in the assembly, mm -hmm. we voted for a transportation trust fund, a stable source of funding, right. which people say right now is shaky, doesn't have what it needs to provide money for roads and bridges. Right. What would you say to those who say, you know what, we should increase the gas tax in order to put money into that transportation trust fund so we don't have to worry about our roads and bridges? You're a numbers guy. You say? I, I would agree with them. You, and I, I don't hear the Democrats saying, I, I, let's do that. I, 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 I've always touted that. I think we're the third lowest in the nation. In terms in, of the gas tax. Uh, gas tax. Uh, every penny raises between 50 and $70 million. If uh, in modern time, if you're talking about when, when uh, I guess when we started driving or whatnot, you know, five cents of a gallon right. made a lot of difference. Gas fluctuates 20, 30, 40 cents. Nobody really, really sees that difference. So a little bit of money put in that, I think could go such a long way. And I think the people would welcome it. It's something that's dispersed throughout the whole state. Time out, Mr. Speaker. You think the people would welcome it. Then why do you think it is so difficult to get your colleagues to go along and even have a serious discussion about it. There hasn't even been a serious discussion right. to put it on the table, which means they must be afraid of what the, they think the public reaction is going to be. And you just said you think most people in the public would say, hey, listen, we get it. For ro safe roads and bridges, we'll go along. I, I think it's the right way to do it. We've raised tolls. Uh, and that is only a select universe. This would be something that is throughout the whole state. We're a corridor state, so one third of the gas bought here is from out of state. It just makes sense. It has to be framed correctly. I think the reason framed correctly meaning meaning that you have to educate the public and know what this does. As uh, when we were young, we had the best road infrastructure in the nation. It's the same one that was when we were young. It's, it's getting old. It's getting old. Not that, like the rest of us. Uh, we're holding. <laughs> Up okay. <laughs> but it's, it gets dangerous, right? Absolutely. And that is that obligation needs to be looked at. You have to take the bull by the horn. I think what has happened lately, I think our current governor is a non starter with him. So why the. Meaning somebody, he said no. He said no. So why would but, but, somebody. But hold on. I, I appreciate what you're saying, but do you think that you have most of your Democratic colleagues on board with this? I think I, I think um, it's really for a discussion. And I am okay. telling you that that's something that I think is a, an option. Listen, we need a revenue stream. Right now, we've been borrowing for the transportation. In the last four years, we borrowed more than in any other administration. We wanted to do pay as you go, and we have not been able to do that. Right. Uh, so our debt keeps growing. Our obligations keep growing. As I said, we need a revenue stream. That bill and comes due sooner or later. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get a couple minutes left. Um, what issue do you say to yourself, you know, I, 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 no one forced me to be involved in government. In fact, they recruited you mm -hmm. up in uh, Union City? I actually, well, I lived in the Sea Caucus when I got into government. Okay. But you know Hudson County well, yes. and they recruited you into politics. Um, what issue do you say to yourself? You know, I love public service, um, and I really want to make a difference. But there's just, i got two minutes left. Th there's a... There's an issue, there's something that we're not dealing with that really matters to me. What is that? Um, vocational education. I think it's something that we've gotten away from. And I think that for me, uh, coming from the trades and I've gone to college, left that, went into the trades. I think we have focused too much. We spend a lot of money, hundreds of uh, thousands of dollars, K through 12, educating them to go to college. Some kids are not built for college, vocation, 
uh, education would be a great, those trades are mm. a great alternative. They can make good money. I think that that's uh, sensible for the 21st century, that those are great jobs. As the economy gets better, those, those jobs will be there we should be able to be helping some of these kids. Well, what would you do, give them loans, grants, what? Well, I would want to, uh, we've gone away from them. A lot of schools don't offer it anymore. They've actually used those, whether it was shops or uh, mechanic shops or wood shops into additional classrooms. Put that back in, give them that outlet so these kids mm. might be able to, you know, do that partner mm. with apprentice programs, with community colleges, to be able to make that as an alternative route. Before I let you out of here, uh, you're born in 1960, right? Yes. You come here in 1971? Correct. You have an envision yourself standing on that rostrum as the highest ranking member of the state assembly as the speaker. You ever envision that? Uh, not at that time. No, it's an amazing place. <laughs> uh, when I first got sworn in and I sat on that floor, I looked around and looked up. I said, amazing where I am today. A house that stands here since 1776. So I am blessed. I am living the American dream every day. It's a great country, huh? It's a wonderful country. And a great, great, great state as well. Yes, it is. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of One on One has been provided by Barnabas Health, NJM, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. The law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, New Jersey's Credit Unions, PSE&G, TD Bank, Community Education Centers, the New Jersey Hospital Association, and by these public-spirited organizations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the issues that matter. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger, powering NJ.com, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.